So what we're reading here in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 is basically it's the return of the, the ark of God coming back to Jerusalem. So if you remember when the Philistines conquered Saul and they took the ark of the covenant and um, then there were, they were being plagued by it and, and they sent it away because they're just like, you know, all these problems are happening as a result of it. Let's just get out of it, get rid of it. And the ark was, was made it back into Israel and David was going to bring it back and then they put it on that cart and Uzzah died because, you know, the cart started shaking and he put his hand on the ark or something. They weren't supposed to do. They are supposed to be carrying it. And, you know, in this whole story. So for a while, it just sat in the house of Obed-Edom. And they're just like, well, we don't know what we're going to do yet. We're just going to leave it there, right? Because, because this whole thing happened with Uzzah dying. And then Obed-Edom was just getting blessed. Like, he was just being blessed by having the ark at his place. So finally, they get to the point, you know what? We're going to bring it back into Jerusalem. They did it the right way. They bring it back in. It's a real joyous event. It, you know, there's in, the, in chapter 15, you know, there's... there's People playing musical instruments, they're singing, David's dancing, and, you know, and just this big procession of bringing the ark back into Jerusalem. And, it, and it's a very joyous occasion, and they're giving thanks. And in chapter 16 here, we're going to be focusing in on the song that David gives to Asaph at, at, you know, in light of this whole um, event of, of the ark coming back. And what I'm preaching about this evening is giving thanks unto the Lord. Now, we know that this week is the week that we celebrate Thanksgiving. It's coming up this Thursday. And before we even really get into this chapter a little bit and, and getting into the main meat of the sermon, what I want to be talking about with giving thanks, I'm just going to briefly touch on holidays and how we view holidays and what holidays we celebrate and, and things like that. Um, I'm not going to go too in-depth on that, but I just want to bring it up because, you know, again, there's, there's cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses that will say you shouldn't celebrate any holidays. You shouldn't really do anything. No birthdays, nothing like that. And it's, you know, it's all of Satan. It's all of the world. It's all this stuff. Turn, if you would, keep your finger here because we're going to come back here. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 14. So I make a few brief points about this. The word holiday really comes from the word holy day. It's just a, sh you know, a shortening of, as, the, as the language progresses. People call it holy days. And um, the, the more you run the word together, it becomes holiday, which is the way that we know it in, in our modern vernacular today. But um, I, there's nothing wrong with celebrating holidays, even if they're not found in Scripture, right? So... We have a holiday of Thanksgiving coming up on Thursday. That specific holiday, you know, the third Thursday in November every year or whatever, it's not, that's not found in Scripture. That's, that's not something that's, you know, biblical in the sense of you have to celebrate Thanksgiving on this day. Now, the concept of giving thanks unto the Lord is all over the place in the Bible. We're going to cover a lot of that tonight. And I believe of all of the holidays that the United States celebrates, Thanksgiving is one of the most biblical or scriptural concepts as far as celebrating any holiday is concerned. I love Thanksgiving. I think this is a great holiday to take a time back, you know, step back and just be thankful for all that God has blessed you with. And, and it really is. I believe it's a very, a very good holiday to celebrate. But in Romans 14, I just want to point this out real briefly. If you look at verse number 5, the Bible reads, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So first of all, when it comes to celebrating holidays, we take the stance that there's nothing wrong with celebrating the holiday per se, and there's nothing wrong with not celebrating a holiday. So let's say you're sitting here and you say, you know what? I don't celebrate holidays. I don't want to celebrate Thanksgiving. I don't want to celebrate any of these holidays. According to the scripture we're looking at here, okay, you don't have to esteem a day better than another. You don't have to do that. There's nothing in scripture that says, you know, if your country has holidays, you have to celebrate them all, right? Of course not. But you also can't look at the person who does want to celebrate Thanksgiving and say, well, Thanksgiving's not in Scripture, so you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be celebrating that. And, you know, people don't do that with Thanksgiving as much as they will for, like, Christmas or Easter. 
And um, I know there's, there's more to it than that. And people will claim that there's, you know, it's a pagan day. But I'll tell you this much, that pagans don't have the, the like, a lock on certain days of the year. They don't just say, like, well, this is a pagan day. Because if we look at what days are pagan, every day of the week is a pagan day. If you're going to call Sunday, Sunday, well, Sunday is named off of the sun, right? Monday is based off of the moon, moon day. You want to know what Thursday is? Thor's day. So are we going to stop calling Thursday, Thor's day because it's pagan? How about Saturday, you know, Saturn day? I mean, we have so much in our past, in our history, that is heathen, that is pagan, that is a part of everyday life. At what point are you going to stop and just say, well, no, we're not going to do this? Because it's pagan. You could say, well, December 25th is a pagan day. Is it really a pagan day? I don't believe it is. I think it's a day of the week. Now, is that the day that Jesus Christ was born? Probably not, but I don't know that. I have no idea when he was born, and, and nobody does because it's not recorded as exactly when he was born. You can, you can try to get some understanding of around the time based on the things that were going on, but no one knows the exact day. And the way that we stand is if if you want to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, I have no problem with celebrating on any day of the year. Amen. But what we, what we do is we, we live in a society where a day has already been selected hundreds of years ago. And you could go into why was that day selected and they were trying to convert pagans and all this other stuff. But where are we at today? When people celebrate Christmas, now, as far as Christmas is concerned, you know, we don't do Santa Claus and the reindeer and all this other stuff that have nothing to do with celebrating the birth of Christ. I think that that is wrong. I don't think we should be doing that and just, and just going down this path of jolly old St. Nicholas, okay? But I see nothing wrong if somebody wants to set aside a day and say, we're going to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We, we appreciate the fact that he came and died for our sins. We don't know what day of the year that he, that he was born on. And no one knows for sure the day that he was born on. We're going we're gonna to celebrate on this day. I mean, this is what people have already been celebrating on. I'm going to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on this day. And what we're going to do is, is do just that. Now, if you choose to not celebrate that day, according to the Bible, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's what the Bible says. Hey, you don't have to esteem that day above any other day. That's perfectly fine. And, and we're not going to take the stance of, you must celebrate Christmas, you know. No. But what we also don't like is when someone does decide to esteem this day above other days and celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, don't be saying, well, you're in sin for doing that. If you're esteeming that day for our Lord. Because the Bible says here in Romans 14, Verse 6, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not and giveth God thanks. See, the point is, are you doing this for the Lord or not? See, people get caught up in the commercialism, especially with Christmas, of, you know, just, just this whole buying gifts and everyone has to give gifts for everybody because it's Christmas and you're just obligated to do so. You're not doing it because you love people. You're just, it's just well, it's Christmas, so we have to just buy gifts and get caught up in this whole buying and, and just completely lose what it's all about. And the world twists and, and will make everything, anything that's somewhat good and just pervert it and into this whole Santa Claus thing and whatever. And Easter, you got the Easter bunny and everything else. But um, when it comes to celebrating holidays, either you're going to esteem it or you're not. Okay? And obviously we're not talking about something like Halloween that really has no, <laughs> no basis at all and no justification for celebrating death and for celebrating wizards and witches and all the things that the Bible is completely against. Darkness, I mean, that's all associated with Halloween, and that's what Halloween's all about. But other day, I mean, Independence Day, you want to celebrate that? I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with that in Scripture. It's definitely not something you have to do, but you want to steam that day? Fine. Go ahead and do it. We actually have an example of a holiday being created by the children of Israel in the book of Esther. If you turn, if you would, to the book of Esther...
We're going to look at chapter number 9. Now, there were holidays established by God in the law. There were the feasts that were established that God said, you must participate in these things. You are, you are attending these events. And that was by law. Those were holy days. There were Sabbaths, these high Sabbath days that were something that the children of Israel did need to participate in. But anything outside of that is not forbidden. It's not required, but it's not forbidden. And if you remember the story in Esther, just a brief summary, you had um, Esther became the queen, and uh, as King Ahasuerus, Esther was the queen, and Mordecai, or um, excuse me, Haman was the, the kind of the second in command. And he hated Mordecai the Jew because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him because he believed in the Lord. He wouldn't bow down to any man because he's only going to worship God. So he's not going to bow down to Mordecai as part of his faith, as something that he shouldn't do because God said it's not something to do. So Haman hated Mordecai for this, and he decided, you know what? He found out, he's like, all the Jews are like this. That's part of their religion. That's what they believe. None of them are going to bow down to you because of their faith. So he worked it out to, with King Ahasuerus where, where he just basically got him to sign off to go out and destroy all the Jews. And Mordecai heard about this and he went to Esther and said, you know what, you need to stand in for the people here. You have an opportunity. You're the king's wife. You need to go and speak to him to stop this from happening and to deliver Israel, right? So the whole thing happens. You know, she goes in and, and you know, read the whole book. A great book, wonderful book of the Bible. Great story. And basically, the Jews are delivered, right? Uh, Haman gets found out. He gets killed. And his whole family gets killed and stuff. And, and, you know, justice is served. But what happens here is that basically the Jews are allowed to defend themselves. Because before, they were just going to get slaughtered. Like, that was just kind of the decree, is that they're just going to get slaughtered. But the way that the king made it was that, okay, well, you guys can do whatever you need to do to defend yourself. So in um, two days, they basically um, were able to defend themselves. They had this great victory and defeated all their enemies. And the Bible actually says that a lot of people became Jews as a result of all this. So, so something that was meant to, to cause all kinds of harm and damage to the people of God turned out to end up being a good thing. You know, all things work together for good to... Um, to those that love God, right? To them that are called according to the purpose. And we see that playing out in Esther. But look at Esther chapter 9, verse number 18. It becomes a point of celebration that, that, uh, of the great victory that God had wrought. Esther chapter 9, verse 18. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day thereof and on the 14th day thereof. And on the 15th day of the same they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month Adar a day of gladness and feasting and a good day and of sending portions one to another. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king of Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and of sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. So he declares a holiday here on these two days, in remembrance of the things that happened. He says, you know what? Every year on these days, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have feasting. We're going to gather together and, and enjoy meals together. We're going to enjoy ourselves. We're going to celebrate. We're going to give God thanks for everything that happened. We're going to send portions one to another. We're going to do good things for each other. We're going to give gifts to the poor. All of this stuff in recognition of celebrating these days. This was not or, you know, like, like God instituted in his law or anything like that. But there's nothing wrong with this whatsoever. 
This is perfectly acceptable unto God. And, he th and I'm sure he probably thinks that's great. They're recognizing these days that God wrought a great victory. And again, this is the stance that we take here. If you're going to take some time and you're going to take some days and you're going to honor the Lord and you're going to recognize God and you're going to be thankful, then praise God for it because you're, you're unto the Lord you regard the day. And if you don't regard the day, you're not sinning at all. There's nothing wrong with that, and you're not to be condemned either. But to the Lord, you're not going to regard. You know, it's just, that's fine. It's another day. And again, this is, you know, and this is where, where we stand. I just wanted to bring that up because I'm going to be talking a lot more about being thankful and Thanksgiving. We've got Thanksgiving come up on Thursday. And I think it's a great holiday, and I think that people should celebrate it. But again, you don't want to, you don't have to. No, no problems at all. But there's a lot of biblical reasons for being thankful and taking time to just to express yeah. that thanks unto the Lord. Amen. And, you know, on the holiday things, I don't, want to get, I don't want that to be an entire sermon because I could preach an entire sermon on all the details on the various holidays, especially Christmas and Easter and, and, and all the different things that, that people have problems with. But I'm not going to do that tonight. I could talk to you after service if you're interested in that. But... Um, when it comes closer to Easter time, I was, I was already preparing to um, kind of give an explanation on, on what we celebrate in regards to that also. Again, it's not the Easter bunny. We're not hunting eggs. We're not, you know, like, it's, it's not what the world celebrates at all by any means. Right. But um, that being said, let's continue on here. Let's, look, let's dig into uh, 1 Chronicles 16 where we started off reading from. Because what we find here is a similar situation to what we saw in the book of Esther. It's a, it's a, it's a great day of rejoicing, right? There's a victory that's wrought. The, 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 um, the Ark of the Covenant has come back into Jerusalem. Something to be happy about. There's a victory wrought over the Philistines. Jump down to verse number 7. Bible reads, Then on that day David delivered first this psalm. To thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. So Asaph was what was basically like a song leader. So he gives Asaph this song unto him and his brethren so that they can play and sing this song to give glory unto God. David wrote it. He's like, here's this new song. I want you guys to play this and perform this. And then it continues on with the song. And, and the whole point of the song is to thank God. And that's one of the things that we do in church, by the way. When we sing in the congregation and we sing unto the Lord, we're praising God and we're giving thanks unto Him. You know, I was one of those people that didn't, you know, I loved music, but I didn't really like to sing. And when I would go to church, I would just sit there and look at the songbook and I would kind of read it and not participate in the singing. And honestly, I believe I wasn't right with God when I wasn't participating in the singing and praising our Lord and Savior. I think that's something that we all ought to do. I think it's something that we should, should give our sacrifice of praise unto the Lord, as the Bible says. And, you know, people might think, and, and I was kind of self-conscious about my voice and stuff like that. But I'll tell you what, in the house of God, God's the one who created the tongue. God's the one who gave you your voice. God's the one who made you the way that you are. And it doesn't matter what you sound like if you're making a joyful noise unto the Lord. God is going to appreciate that. You're not singing to impress the person sitting next to you. That's not why you sing praises unto God. And if it is, then you're not right with God either. If you're just singing to be, you know, oh, look at how good I am and, and everybody notice how well I sing. You don't get the glory for the singing. God gets the glory. That's the whole point. But we ought to be giving thanks unto God. And that's what we do. When you, when you read these songs, you know, we sing songs that have doctrine to it and songs that have a lot of meaning behind the words. And the most of them are praises to the Lord. They're, I mean, we are giving thanks unto God and we're singing it out and it's a joyful sound. God wants to hear your voice. And this is, I, I've made this analogy before, but as a parent, I love to hear my children sing. Now, my oldest isn't even seven yet, okay? They don't know how to really carry a tune that well. You know, there's, they, they, they sing like children sing. But to me, I love it. I think it's awesome. Now, it's not something that they're going to be on American Idol or on any of these shows as having these amazing voices that the whole world's going to love. But you know what? To me, 
They're some of the best sounds that I've ever heard. Amen. As their father, I love to hear that. And you know what? We have a heavenly father that wants to hear your voice sing and give thanks and praise his name. It is a wonderful thing for God to hear. And that's why we do it. It's for his benefit. But just keep that in mind. And, and see, David creates this song. We have the whole book of Psalms is a song book. That's what the Psalms are. And um, it's, <laughs> they're all designed to give praise and honor and glory unto God, which, by the way, happens to be the biggest book in the whole Bible, the book of Psalms. It's a praise book unto our Lord. So keep that in mind when you, know, when you sing. And, you know, I don't just look at every person, but I think everybody in church sings anyway. So it's not like it's a problem that we have here. I just like to mention it from time to time because the singing is important. You might think, well, why do we sing in church? Why don't we just come and hear the preaching? It's not just all about the preaching. There's many things involved in the, in the, the fellowship and the church service when we come together and we give thanks unto our God. Everything should be glorifying unto him. But... Um, so that being said, I know I kind of talked a lot in verse number seven. Let's go down to verse number eight here. He delivers this song unto Asaph, verse eight. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Now, I want to focus in there on verse number eight. And verse number eight is kind of where I really got the main theme for, for the sermon tonight. Give thanks unto the Lord. There's three things listed here. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. And this Thursday is coming up as we celebrate Thanksgiving. I want you to remember these three things when you're celebrating. Give thanks unto the Lord, first of all. First and foremost, we're celebrating Thanksgiving. Who else do we have to thank but God? Amen. Give thanks unto the Lord. It's not just, you know, and again, people kind of get sidetracked, and now it's getting into this whole shopping thing, and you have the Black Friday, and people are just, just so focused. They go into Thanksgiving thinking about shopping the next day and just spending and consuming and buying instead of just enjoying and being thankful for your friends, your family, and everything that God has given you in your life. Now, all of a sudden, they're focused on this commercialism. I and mean, it's gotten so bad to the point, I don't know what they're doing this year. I don't really follow it that much. But I know in the past, it's like they keep pushing the times earlier and earlier to the point to where now you can basically just go shopping on Thanksgiving. Where they've just, they've just made it like, well, just go shopping, you know, because they're just, they're just greedy and just want to make more and more and more money. And people just so focused on all the wrong things. This Thanksgiving, that ought not to be you. Amen. Don't worry about the sales. Take the day aside to just give thanks and to recognize everything and, and get the, the covetousness out of your mind. Be thankful for what you have, not be thinking about what you don't have. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Actually call, use the word Jesus Christ. Call on his name and make known his deeds among the people. I'm going to get into all three of those points. Uh, verse number 23 there in 1 uh, Chronicles 16 says, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Obviously, giving thanks and singing unto God, it's not something that's only done on one day. right? This is something we should be doing all the time. This is something that we should do day to day. But putting aside a day, I think, is great. You just kind of make sure you do it. And we could all join together and take, the, you know, and take this time and say, we're going to give thanks on this day. I think that's great. Obviously, again, you could look and say, well, you're always supposed to be giving thanks. Yeah, we should. Absolutely. Amen. And I'm going to be preaching that too. But let's not forget the whole point of the day coming up on Thursday. A lot of things to give thanks for. And the majority of the sermon now is going to be just dealing with all the various things that we should give thanks for. I mean, maybe you're sitting here tonight and saying, you know what? Things aren't going very well for me at all. I don't even know what I should be thankful for. And a lot of people have, have hard times and, and go through difficulties. And it's easy to fall into the trap of forgetting all of the good things that you do have in this life. And, and kind of getting down and becoming a complainer more than just being thankful for, for, for what you actually have. 
Everyone's got their own struggles and difficulties. Some people are a little bit more comfortable than others. But we, we shouldn't be spending our time focusing in on how other people live their life and their comforts and what they have. Because when you do that, you lose sight of the things that God has done for you. You don't have to worry about what God has done for anybody else. Think about what he's done for you. Because at the end of the day, we don't deserve the mercy. We don't deserve the kindness and the long suffering. We're sinners. We've broken God's laws. He told us not to do things and we've done them. And we've done them that are bad things are bad enough that deserve a punishment of hell. So the first thing that we ought to give thanks for is our salvation. For the fact that God loved us so much to save our wicked souls, to, to just give us a free gift, to say, God, to say, I love you and I love you so much and I want you to be with me that all the work is done for you to do. Here's a giving of gift. Receive this gift. It's free. I want you to have it. Just accept it. Call on the name of the Lord and get saved. And, and that's, that's what he's done for us. He could have made it really difficult. He could have said, well, no, I mean, hey, you want to be with me? You got to live holy. Hey, you want to be with me? You better fight, you shape up, man. Get your act together and do all of these works. He could have made it like that if he wanted to. Sure. And that's actually the only other way of salvation is if you do that perfectly without screwing up. Unfortunately, no one's able to do that. But thankfully, we do have a God that's loving and merciful and kind and, and, and long-suffering that has given us a free gift. That is something we ought to be thankful every single day of our lives. That is something that will keep you humble, that will keep you in the right mindset of knowing that God saved me. He saved me. I didn't deserve it. I don't, you know, I, he gave me a free gift. Thank God for that. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And we could stop right there. <laughs> and that is way more than enough to be thankful for every day of the year. So I don't want to understate that. And, and I know everyone here knows this, but we need to just come back to that time and time again to keep our minds right, to keep a renewing of our mind in this wicked and perverse world. It's so easy to get off track and to be thinking and, and, and focus on the other things. Hey, let's give thanks for our salvation. I mean, you might be like me. I've been saved for, you know, 19 years. You don't want that to become old. Yeah, you know, that's something I did 19 years ago. No. Thank God every day for saving me 19 years ago. You know, it's not, it's not something that just become, we come flippant about. Number two, as we see here, and, and actually it's one of the things, it's written in this song, and when you go through the book of Psalms, you know what I'm talking about? Where the, the phrase, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Give thanks unto the Lord. He's good. His mercy endures forever. Great reason to give thanks. His mercy isn't temporary. His mercy isn't something that just lasts a short period of time. It's like our salvation isn't, well, I'm saved now. Now I'm not. Now I'm saved. Now I'm not. And I just need to keep on walking this, this, this fine line of, of salvation. His mercy endures forever. Once you get that gift of eternal life, it's, you're saved forever. And his mercy is, 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 goes well beyond all of your sins. And, you know, even besides the, 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 the salvation aspect of it, God is a very merciful God, even when it comes to our judgment as his children in this world. You know, the Bible says that we're going to reap what we sow, and we do. But I know plenty of times where I've slipped up and been repentant and God has extended mercy on me when I know that I should have deserved way more of, of, of a disciplining or a chastisement in this earth for what I've done than I, than I ended up receiving. Now, maybe I haven't received it yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe the seed was sown and I'm going to reap it a little bit later on. I don't know. Okay, but all I know at this point, and I can think back for all these years, God has been extremely merciful unto me. And praise God for that. That is something to be thankful for. And God is a loving God. He, he is a merciful God. That's something we ought to be thankful for. Um, 
Psalm 97, 12 says, Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. So I went through a lot of, a lot of uh, Scripture and was doing some word searches on being thankful in the Bible. It's a great study. I didn't include everything out here. There's a lot to be thankful for, and I wanted to make sure. Obviously, there's a lot of things I could think of that we ought to be thankful for and the things we ought to recognize. But I really wanted to know, what is the Bible saying that we need to be thankful for? Because that's the most important stuff anyways. Obviously, there's, I mean, everything in our life we could be thankful for, but the Bible says to give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. We have a holy God. We have a perfect and, 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 a, and a God that's, that's completely holy, it's completely separate from all the filth of this world. I give thanks for that. Thank you, God, for being a righteous judge, for being a righteous God, for being a holy God. It, 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 it really works in our favor <laughs> that God is like that, that he is so holy. And um, it's something that we ought, to, we ought to rejoice over. Number four, we need to be thankful for God's wonderful works unto mankind, unto us in general. Um, Psalm 107, verse 21 reads, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. God has worked a lot in your life, whether you recognize it or not. God has done a lot I think in the individual lives of many people, of, of, most, of, of every believer, it's a, it's a matter of you recognizing it, though. Yeah. There's a lot of things that happen. A lot of people blow off as being coincidences right. when God really has his hand in a matter. I, I believe that... Um, you know, God's done a lot in my life, and I don't want to bring up all the specifics, but I was just blessed recently at work with, uh, with, 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 with something from my boss that, that has lifted a, a heavy burden that I've been bearing for a while. And, uh, and I praise God for that. And I believe that God has had his hand in that, and if God didn't have his hand in it, it wouldn't have worked out the way that it has. And again, I don't want to share all the details about that, but um, I'm sure you have similar experiences where you can look back. I mean, I look at the experience of, of even moving up here. We have a house that was completely upside down. We're underwater because we bought it at the wrong time. The value is way down. I wanted to, to end up, you know, start a church and pastor and stuff, but we have this burden of, well, what are we going to do with this house? I can't afford just to own two houses and just, you know, like, well, whatever. You know, I couldn't afford to take the big hit either. I couldn't do any of that. And uh, it worked out to where we're able to rent out that house and find the perfect place up here that every, and, and you know, we look back, everything worked out. It was out of our price range. We looked at all the houses. That one was the perfect one. The parking was great. We, had, we were able to accommodate many people coming. We had an entire room just set up. You couldn't have designed it better to have a church service in. I mean, it's just this total separate carpeted room with plenty of area to, to put chairs across. We had the piano in there, a pulpit, everything. I mean, basically what you see here was in this room at my house. And it was awesome. And the, the, you know, the, the price came down like just to, to hit the max of what, of what we were able to afford like the same day that we were looking at it. It just, oh, here's a price drop, you know, $15,000. Wow. Hey, all of a sudden we can afford this house. And you look back on these things and, and, and just the progression and the way everything happened, God made it possible for us to be here and to do this great work. And, and I could have said, and there's so much more to that story, I don't want to get all, all into it with all the details. I'll tell you about it if you haven't heard it before. But it's amazing how that happens and, and the work that God does in our lives. And when you have the right focus, the right, the right sense and, and understanding these things and understanding that you have a, a father that loves you, you can look and see his hand in things where I think many people too often times are blinded to it and, and don't see the blessings of God uh, w for what they really are and don't end up giving God the credit that he deserves. Number five, sing with thanksgiving to the Lord. We ought to be thankful and sing. I, I, I'm going to be, I'm planning on singing praises unto God this Thanksgiving with my family. 
with my children, with my wife, and, and actually singing and giving God thanks. If we're going to take a day aside to be thankful, one of the ways that you'll find all throughout Scripture, and you'll notice that, that a lot of the verses that, that I'm bringing up are Psalms, about talking about giving thanks unto God. And Psalms are songs. And, and the, the thanksgiving, you know, the word praise, you're praising God, you're giving God thanks. The Bible says in Psalm 147, 7, Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. Hebrews 13, 15 says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Sacrifice of praise. You want to offer a sacrifice unto God? Well, we don't do the, the, the bulls and goats and the, the blood sacrifices, but you know what God wants from you as far as the sacrifice goes? The sacrifice of praise. Esteeming Him with your lips, singing unto Him, being thankful and giving thanks unto Him, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. That is one way that you can show your respect and show your thankfulness unto the Lord by singing. Number six, give thanks for your daily bread, for the food that you eat. You notice every time we do a church activity, we have food, what do we do? We say a prayer and we give thanks for what we have. We thank God for the food that we have. And honestly, this is something that we ought to be doing daily. When you study scripture, when you look at every time that Jesus Christ ever distributed food, it always says he, he blessed and gave thanks and gave out the bread, right? So when you, when you read the accounts of the Last Supper, he gave thanks unto God, he broke the bed, he passed out. When you look at the, the feeding of the 5,000 of the 4,000, what did he do? He blessed God, he gave thanks, and he distributed the food. Every single time you see Jesus Christ and the disciples and the apostles, you know, deal with the food, they give thanks. Every, time, every time we eat, we ought to be giving thanks. And this is something you ought to get in the habit of is just saying, thank you, God. That's why the, the prayer that Jesus taught when his disciples said, hey, can you preach us, teach us how to pray like, like you know, John taught his disciples? He says, well, when you pray, you know, when he goes through the, what's known as the Lord's Prayer, where he says, give us this day our daily bread. That means you're praying to God every day for your food. God, take care of me today, please. You know, God, God give me my daily bread. Where, and, and what that demonstrates is a reliance on God every day of your life. Right. Where you're not relying on your own strength, you're not relying on your own might and your own power and, and your own money and everything. You're relying on God. It's going to have you, let you have the right focus in your life and the, the humility. God, help me out today. God, I need food today. God, help me out. And then every time you eat, Thank you, God. Thank you for providing me a warm place to sleep tonight. Thank you for giving me this food. God, thank you for my health. Thank you for all that I have. Thank you, Lord. We ought to be giving thanks. And as we read earlier in Romans 14, you know, uh, talking about the different days and celebrating holidays, in verse 6, I'll reread this for you again. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 reads, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So he's, he's given you here, you know, in the last times, you know, there's going to be these false doctrines, there's going to be people preaching these things and basically telling you, you know, you can't eat this, you can't, you know, he's going back to some dietary restrictions that have already been lifted. And we see that with the Catholic Church, you know, they'll say, you know, you can't eat meat on Fridays or whatever during Lent and everything, you know, all their other rules and forbidding to marry, right? Their priests aren't allowed to get married and all this other nonsense. I mean, to me, it just screams of the Catholic Church. But um, the Bible says that, you know, these false prophets are going to be telling you to abstain from meats that God has created to be received with thanksgiving. And again, but the, the one I'm focusing on there is to be received with thanksgiving. 
our meat, what we eat, ought to be received always with thanksgiving, with the giving of thanks unto God. The Bible says in verse 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And I don't think when I went over um, last week, when I went through Hebrews and kind of discussed some of the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament, this is just one more uh, piece of scripture that, that tells us that the dietary restrictions from the Mosaic law has been lifted. And again, that's an entire sermon in and of itself. But today, you know, the, the atheists want to mock and say, oh, I bet you eat shellfish. Oh, I bet, you know, like, yeah, I do. Because what God has, has cleansed, that call out thou unclean. You know, it's, 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 it's something that has been changed in the New Testament. And what we see here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, you know what? Those that believe and know the truth, every creature of God, everything that God has created is to be received with thanksgiving. Uh, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. It's talking about what we could eat. But whatever you get, give God the thanks for it. Number seven, thank God for all the good things that people do for you. Not just what God has had his hand in, but what people do, what other people do for you, because it still comes from God. Right. We give God thanks for the nice things that other people do for you. Now, thank the people too, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But what we need to recognize is the true source of everything that we receive really does end up coming from the Lord. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16 says, But thanks be to God, listen to this, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. Titus cared about the Corinthians. In Titus's heart, he had a care for them. He wanted to help them out. And what Paul is saying, he says, Thanks be to God, that put that care into the heart of Titus to help you out. Now, should they be thankful to Titus? Absolutely. For caring about them and, you know, and trying to help them out. But thank God that, that he gave Titus that care to care for them. That's what he's saying here. We need to recognize that and not just stop with the giving of thanks to the person. I'm thankful to my boss for helping me out in the way that he did. I am. I'm very thankful that I expressed that to him. But you know what? I'm thankful to God for putting it in his heart to do that for me. God gets that credit and God gets that praise. It's, we need to be thankful and recognize these things in our day-to-day -day life. We need to thank God for fighting our battles for us and giving us a victory. Another common theme throughout the Bible, I'll just read this for you, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Thanks to God causes us to triumph in Christ. That's where our victory lies. Thank God for that. Give thanks for everything. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, In everything give thanks thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know what God's will is for you? That you give thanks in everything. Everything. Don't focus on the things you don't have. That is a trap. That is going to make you a miserable person. That is going to lead to a lot of depression. A lot of people who are depressed these days and I'm not saying this is the case in everything. Obviously, there's lots of different reasons that could cause people to, to have grief and sorrow. But a lot of the focus tends to be on the wrong things. How you spend your time thinking on things. When you think about what I don't have, when you think about, you know, well, I don't have this and I don't have that, you're just going to make yourself miserable and you know what's going to happen. That's a type of a covetous attitude where nothing is ever going to be enough. Because once you get whatever it is that you don't, you don't have that you think is going to make you happy and better off, there's going to be a problem with it. Oh, I don't have, and, and here's a silly example. Because, you know, well, I don't have this boat, right? I want to have this boat. You find, I've never owned a boat before. And I, you know, all my friends have boats. And like, I want to have this boat. They get to go out and they get to vacation. And they get to go have fun and go fishing and do all this other stuff, right? And they have it. I work real hard. Why don't I have it? And then you finally get a boat. And then you know what happens? You got to pay insurance for it. 
You got to maintain it. You got to get the gas. It turns out to be this big hassle. You know, I got to get a truck and now I got to get a trailer and now I got to do this and now I got to pay for it to be stored somewhere. And it becomes way more than you realized it was going to be. Yeah. And you know what? And you realize, yeah, it's fun the first couple of times, but now it's just everyone else has one. I got one now. Okay. What else? What else do I need now? What else don't I have? Right? That doesn't fill the void. That doesn't make you happy. You're always going to be looking. When you look at the things you don't have, you're always going to be looking at the things you don't have. It's a wrong attitude to have. And a lot of people, it, it causes them to be miserable. There's no joy there. But what causes you joy is being, looking at the things that you do have. Instead of saying, man, I wish I had a bigger house. Do you have a house? Right. Man, I wish I had another car. Do you have a car? <laughs> right? <laughs> Man, I wish I didn't have this 250,000 mile car that breaks down every other week. Are you thankful that you have that? Because you don't have to have that. Because guess what? God could take that away from you. That's something I have to inform my children of all the time. And, and, and we've got pretty good now in my house. The kids don't, don't really complain about their food anymore. Because you know what? If you want to complain about the food that your dad worked hard for and your mom worked hard to get on the plate in front of you, you're going to complain about it, you don't have to eat it. And you can go to bed hungry and you can see how much you like that. Right. As a lesson to teach what we ought to be thankful for and not spoiled about and, and, and become these spoiled brats. And I'm talking to us now. Being thankful for what we have and not focus on what we don't have and not become complainers God hates complaining. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 11. See, we need to give thanks in everything. That's where we started off here on this last point here on, verse, on, on giving thanks for everything. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Amen. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, variableness, neither shadow of turning. All of our good, everything that we get that's good in his life comes from God. Amen. We'd be thankful to him for it. This is the attitude that we need to have. We need to focus more on what we have and being thankful for it. Be thankful for the clothes on your back today that you're wearing right now. Be thankful for the food that we had this afternoon. Be thankful that, that you're fed. You're here Everyone here is healthy enough to be here right now. Thank God for that. We're going to see in Numbers 11, and I'm actually, we're going to read through this whole chapter. I'm not going to expound on it too much because we're kind of running out of time. But Numbers chapter 11, because the opposite of being thankful and recognizing the things that you have and giving thanks unto God is going to be complaining about what you don't have. Complaining about things. Murmuring. Look up murmuring in the Old Testament. You're going to see um, how God feels about that. And we're actually going to see how God feels about complaining here in Numbers chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, And when the people complained. Now this is the, the children of Israel that have been wandering in the desert and stuff. And you might want to say, you look at your life where you're at right now. Are you literally wandering in the wilderness? Not caring about, you know, they didn't have a bunch of change of clothing. They didn't have, you know, their dress shoes and then their tennis shoes and then all these other shoes, their boots and their work boots. They didn't have all this stuff that they were just carrying around with them through the wilderness. They didn't have the nice kitchen and the stove and the refrigerator. You know, I mean, they're not hauling refrigerators with them to plug into the rock. To, to provide them with ice for their drink when they're wandering in the wilderness. They ate manna every day for their food. Every single day they ate the same thing. They wandered around in that desert. Now look, you can say they brought it on themselves. Yeah, they did. But even though they did, God still hated when they complained about it because they weren't thankful for what God had done for them. God was, I mean, he was giving them food every single day that they didn't even have to work for. But what we're going to see here in Numbers 11 is they start complaining about that. 
And we're going to see God's reaction to that. And this is, this is a serious issue of, of our rea you know, God's reaction to the complaining. We need to keep this at the forefront of our mind when we feel like we want to complain about the things in our life. We're going to read this whole chapter, Numbers 11. Look at verse number 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it. And his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And he called the name of that place Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? See, the manna wasn't good enough. They wanted like, uh, meat. They wanted chicken. They wanted ribs. They wanted whatever, right? They wanted their beef. They, and, and they're saying, well, who's going to give us flesh to eat? Verse 5, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. Yeah, in Egypt where they were in bondage, where they had taskmasters over them saying, get your work done. They kind of forgot about that and now they're just thinking about the food that they ate, right? Well, we remember the fish that we had back in Egypt. Start thinking, hey, things weren't so bad back there. Well, at least we had fish. <laughs> yeah, and you were slaves. We remember the fish which we did eat. But look, it's easy to, to, to kind of laugh at this and say, wow, how ridiculous is that? People have the same exact attitude today. The same exact attitude. Don't just look on someone else, look down your nose and say, I can't believe that they would do that. Put that, put that focus back on yourself. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. What happened? The manna has turned into just something old. Just, just, yeah. Yeah, God gave us this manna. That's just that old, that old manna that we've just been having. It's a miracle that you have that and God's providing for you. Yeah, it's just manna now. They were thankful for it when they first got it, but now it's just become old. Just, Whatever. I want something else. I'm not satisfied with this anymore. Verse 7, And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as a taste of fresh oil. And when the dew fell upon the camp in the night, the manna fell upon it. So they had many ways of preparing it. It wasn't just one super bland thing. And the Bible says it tasted like honey. I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty, pretty nice thing to eat, you know. Verse 10, Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. This made God really angry. Moses also was displeased, and Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant, and wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. Moses is in, pretty, is in a lot, great deal of despair here. Why? One, he loves the children of Israel. And that's evident throughout the Bible as he intercedes for them time and time again when God's ready just to destroy them for their, for their disobedience. And Moses you know, prays for them. God, you know, don't do this. You know, spare them. Show your mercy. God loves his, or Moses loves his people. But it wears on you. When all you hear now is just a bunch of complaints, and it's like everyone's just complaining to him. Oh, you know, like a bunch of spoiled little children all going to Mo Moses. Oh, I remember when we had all this food in Egypt. Now it's this. You know, we're in this wilderness, and all we have is this man. And, you know, and it's just constant to the point where Moses just is ready to die. He's like, God, you know, I didn't give birth to all these kids. You know, <laughs> I I'm not responsible for all of these people. You put me in charge now, and I just can't deal with this anymore. Now, there's a point to be made here, especially for children, and I know there's some children listening right now, or they ought to be. Remember that. You all start complaining to your dad about the person who's feeding you. 
oh man, why can't we have this? Why can't we have that? You don't want to drive your dad to the point to where he wants to die. <laughs> because that's what happens when you are providing for someone, when you are trying to lead and you're doing your best to care for the people under your care. It bothers you when you feel inadequate and what you're doing isn't enough for them. See, it's not just all about you. You need to remember the other person. You know, and children, remember this about your parents. They're doing their best for you because they care about you. And when you're just focused on yourself, you completely forget about them. And if you have any care at all for them, you ought to be thinking about them and saying, you know what? I know my mom and dad love me and they're doing their best for me. So I'm going to be thankful for what they've done for me as opposed to maybe having parents that just beat their children senseless and don't care about them at all and make them go off to work or find their own way to find food because they're drug addicts and alcoholics and whatever. I'm going to be thankful for the parents that I have that actually love me and are, and are giving me this food to eat and taking care of me the way that they're taking care of me. See, there's a lot, there's, there's all perspective. We need to keep our perspective straight because there's always people that have things worse than you do. But let's keep reading here. So Moses is in despair. You know, these, these people have caused Moses to get to the point to where he's ready to die. So he can't deal with it anymore. Verse 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spear which is upon thee. Let's jump down a little bit just for sake of time. Well, verse number 18, and, and say thou unto the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For ye have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. You got to say, Okay, I heard you. Guess what? You're going to get some flesh to eat. Verse 19, Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month. Look at this. Until it come out at your nostrils. I'm going to give you so much food, it's going to be coming out your nose. And it'd be loathsome unto you. I'm going to give you so much, you're going to hate it. The food that you're desiring so much right now, and you just want to have it more than anything else in the world, and you're saying you wish you were back in Egypt being a slave because you don't have this food, guess what? You're going to get it, and you're going to get it good. And you're going to end up hating it by the time I'm done with you. Because that you have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him saying, why came we forth out of Egypt? What an ungrateful attitude. The Lord that saved you with a high hand and a mighty arm, all the miracles that were showed just to get you out of that bondage and to bring you into a land that's going to be great for you and take care of you and give you this great inheritance and everything else. Because we can't satisfy our belly a little bit, our our, our fleshly lust desire for, for some fish or for, you know, for some meat. And Moses said, the people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. And thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. So Moses is starting to do the math on this saying, it's a lot of people. 600,000 footmen. That's not including the women and children. It's like over a million people. He's saying, you're going to give them food for a month? Out here in the desert? Out here in the wilderness? He says, shall the flocks and herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? He said, so many people are like, what are you going to do? Just get all the fish over here? What are you going to do, God? Verse 23, and the Lord said unto Moses, is the Lord's hand waxed short? <laughs> are you doubting me? Do you think I can't do this? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the seventy men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp and the name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them and they were 
of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp, and there ran a young man, and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad, do prophesy in the camp, and Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, My Lord, Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses gathered him into the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Verse 31, And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side and as it were a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth and the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quails he that gathered least gathered ten homers and they spread them all abroad for themselves around the about the camp so he brings the birds these quails and just makes them all just fly over and just drop down a, a whole day's journey all around the camp, you know, like, what does it say, two cubits high? So it's like three feet high off the ground. Three feet of, of birds is just, <laughs> but I mean, think about how many people you had to feed. So God brings this great miracle, brings flesh. Verse 33, and while the flesh was yet between their teeth, so they're just starting to enjoy it. Ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hadabam, because there they buried the people that lusted. And the people journeyed from Kibroth Hadabam to Hazaroth, and abode at Hazaroth. Important story to keep in mind about our attitude towards the things that we have and the things that we don't have about being a spoiled brat, about being someone who's not grateful for what you have and always focused on what you don't have, God hates that attitude, especially among His people. We are His people today. You're a child of God. God does not want to hear your murmuring and complaining about how bad you have it because you don't realize how good you actually have it. We need to recognize what we have. Recognize the gifts that are given to you. We need to count your blessings. And look, if you, if you, if you struggle in the area of, of maybe going through a tough time, here is something that will help you. Guaranteed. Make a list and start writing down the things that you do have good in your life. For example, a shelter. As it's getting colder, as it's a rainy day today, Somewhere that you can stay dry. Clothing that's going to keep you warm. Food that's going to go in your belly. Friends, a church, people to help support you. What, I mean, you can go on and on and on and on. And I encourage you to do so in writing down all the things that you have in this life that matter to you that are good to you, when you focus on those, and especially considering the alternative, I mean, think about your family members. There's so many dysfunctional families out there. I'm, I praise God for the parents that I had. And they weren't even saved. But I praise God for them because I didn't grow up in some of these other households where they didn't love their kid at all. Right. I complained about, you know, and again, I, I had a bad attitude as a child of, oh, why can't I go to Cancun when I'm in high school and want to go on spring break with all these kids that are going to go out and get drunk at these bars in, in Mexico? <laughs> right? Oh, I can't believe you won't let me go. Spoiled brat. Oh, I won't let you let me go to the Metallica concert when I'm 12 years old by myself with my 12-year-old with my friends. <laughs> this is the mindset, Right? This is the attitude of someone who doesn't recognize what you have and not realizing how good it is and, and just being a spoiled brat over what you don't have. Write down the things in your life that, you, that, that are good for you, that are, that, that, that are good. That will change your attitude. Now, one of the blessings that I get personally is from tithing. You say, why do you mean you get blessings from tithing? I do. Because what I do when I tithe, and, and I do pay a tithe because I, I, I'm still employed uh, outside of this church, I identify every area that I have an increase from. 
Because the Bible says, is, you know, it's, it's a tithe on your increase, right? The things where, where you've been blessed on. Uh, it's not just my financial increase. When people do things for us, when we receive gifts, when family members or friends or other people do something for us or they give us something, we're increasing because of that. You know, people give us clothes from time to time. Someone will buy us some food. I tithe on that. And now I'm not saying this because I want to lift myself up. I'm making a point, though, that when I go through, because normally what I do then is I pay my tithes when I receive my actual paycheck. Because, you know, because then I just kind of go through everything for the past two weeks. What have we done? Here's, and this is the way that I do it, right? So right or wrong, you know, you can judge that for yourself. This is the way I do it. And what I do, though, is I make note and I go back and say, okay, what did we receive in the past two weeks? And I started to realize how much we actually get. Things that you don't think about very much. Things that you get used to. You know, sometimes at work, my bosses will provide lunch. Sometimes there's, you know, I mean, there's just various things. Even when we go out as a church, sometimes we'll have food here. And I'll be like, you know what, that's a blessing. To me, it doesn't seem like it sometimes because I'm organizing this stuff, I'm paying for, you know, I, you know I'm doing all the work behind it. But my family receives that just as much as anyone else does. It's a blessing for us. And, you know, there's so many, and this is a little thing, right? It's, it's a small thing. But you start looking at all the small things and it really adds up and you're like, man, praise God. It really makes me thankful to the Lord when I can go back and say, look, at this was done for me, this was done for me. This was done for me. Thanks, God. <laughs> I'm going to recognize that. Here you go. It, it really does. It, it's, it's amazing how that works. That first verse that we focused on, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make his deeds known among the people. We focus a lot on give thanks unto the Lord. And this is what we're going to be doing on Thursday. We need to give thanks. And, and we ought to be doing it every day. But, but let's, let's, this Thanksgiving, if, you, if you're going to recognize the day, let's recognize it unto the Lord. Let's give him thanks for everything in our life. Let's, let's take that time aside and really just, just take some time. Take a break. And you personally give thanks unto God for what you've done. Let's call upon his name. Maybe you're gathering with, with family and friends. Don't be intimidated to not say the name Jesus Christ when you give thanks at your Thanksgiving meal that you're celebrating to give thanks. You could say, thank you, Lord Jesus, and call upon his name in front of you. And I don't care if they hate Jesus or not. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give thanks unto my Savior, regardless of who's around. And, and the last part of that verse says, make known his deeds among the people. That's how we bring glory unto God. We need to make his deeds known. Let other people know about how great our God is and why we can be really thankful because he is our God. He's done a lot. He has done a tremendous amount and continues to do a lot Let's honor him. Let's glorify him by making his deeds known. Let's bow our heads and word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Truly thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. God, we thank you for, for loving us when you didn't have to. We thank you for the, the gift of salvation that you bought and paid for, that you gave us because you love us. We thank you for all that you do for us. God, I thank you for the things that I don't even recognize that you've done in my life. Dear Lord, help me to see all of the areas where you have had your hand in my life. Help us all to see that in our own individual lives, dear Lord. Help us to recognize those areas and, and to give you the, the thanks due. Lord, you love us more than we'll probably ever be able to comprehend, and, and we thank you for that. We thank you for your mercy that endures forever. Help strengthen us Dear God, to have the right attitudes, to be humble, to, to not be complainers and murmurers, but that we can keep our focus on the good that you do for us and that we can share that good news with other people, that we can declare your deeds among the people and that we can call on your name, dear God. I pray that you please give us the boldness to, to share that with other people. And we, we pray uh, that you would just watch over our church, protect us, and help us to grow and help us to continue to, to do the best that we can to bring honor and glory unto your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.